Well, um, let's now turn to uh, the second half of our program and, and cover some of the areas uh, in metastatic breast cancer. Uh, this, of course, continues to be a challenge. It's an area that's more personalized. Uh, it is an area where we've developed a lot of new options and have a lot of interesting data, hopefully that will be translated into the early stage setting. Uh, so why don't we start with the uh, domain of hormonal therapy. Uh, there's actually been um, uh, several new studies that have come out uh, looking at combination hormonal therapy, something that really hasn't been explored much until uh, recently. Joyce, can you uh, get us up to speed on, on where we are in that area? Yes, there were two frontline trials, postmenopausal ER positive, breast cancer, both randomizations were the same. It was anastrozole plus minus fulvestrant. And um, the FACT trial showed no difference between the two, which is kind of what we'd probably expect. But the um, S0226, the SWOG study, showed actually improved disease-free and overall survival, or sorry, progression-free and overall survival with the um, combination. And the real difference between the trials was that the SWOG trial had uh, many more de novo metastatic patients who had not seen prior tamoxifen. But the fulvestrin dose was the lower dose. It was the 250 milligrams. It wasn't the, the new higher dose. So we're really still uncertain using the higher dose of the fulvestrin, which I think we all do now with the 500 day, you know, 0, 14, uh, 29, and then monthly thereafter, whether really the addition of the um, anastrozole would make a difference, et cetera. Um, Having said all of that, uh, what I'm doing is when I do have a de novo patient, I am considering um, the combination. I am giving the higher dose of the fulvestrant, however, but um, it certainly is intriguing um, to consider that really optimizing um, ER blockade in, in that particular setting might give the women longer progression for an overall survival. I still think we don't know rigorously the answer to that with, to, with the optimal dose of the fulvestrin, but you know that's how I've come down on the data. Now it's my understanding that in vitro data in this setting, looking at all combinations, so looking at the combination that was used in the ATAC trial would have predicted no benefit of the combination. And, and so most combinations that have been looked at to this point, MEGACE combinations in vitro have all been negative and we've never had a hint that they would be better, but the fulvestrant AI data in, in mice or whatever the laboratory animal is that's being used uh, does show synergy. And so there were hints prior to going into this trial that there might be something there. Yes, it's interesting. You know, fulvestrant has been around for a long time uh, and has been used in laboratory models as the pure antiestrogen that overcomes tamoxifen resistance. So maybe we are finally seeing this play out in, in the clinic. Uh, the, the other area that, of course, has uh, generated a lot of interest led to uh, FDA approval of a new drug uh, in hormonal therapy, which has been quite a while since we've had a new drug, is the combination of Averolimus and, and uh, pretty significant benefits that we're seeing there. Can you uh, uh, update us on the latest there, Christy? Certainly. So this was based on the, what was called the Bolero II trial, and, and one of the things that's intriguing to me is how fast we've come from presentation of that data to FDA approval. And I think it just speaks to the very significant benefit um, that was seen there. So these were postmenopausal women, a little bit over 700 postmenopausal women, all of whom had metastatic breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive, HER2 new negative. And those women um, were randomly assigned the women had to have at some time been exposed to one of the non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors, letrozole or anastrozole. It did not have to be their last therapy, however. And they were then randomized to exemestane with or without the everolimus. Uh, it was a two to one randomization. And progression-free survival was the statistical endpoint. Um, but if you look at the investigators benefit. It was about a four and a half month improvement. If you look at the independent review, it's a seven month benefit in progression free survival, favoring the Everolimus. Um, and it has some very unique toxicity. So I think we're all learning about this uh, class effect of um, the uh, non-infectious pneumonitis and some renal insufficiency and stomatitis. It's, it's very unique for us um, as this class of drugs, but I think it's really a huge step forward um, in this field, and that's why it's now moved into the adjuvant setting so quickly. I just want to mention that um, I had come across an abstract, perhaps it was a publication, looking at prophylactic steroid mouth rinses. And so we've, everybody's got their miracle mouthwash formulation, 
And if you, um, the pharmacist has started to crush the hydrocortisone and put it into the Miracle mouthwash, and it's a prophylactic swish and spit three, four times a day, has, I have not had to dose reduce once since that time. And I was having some mm -hmm. real issues on stomatitis in the beginning, you know. Um, not once. It has made a huge difference without any thrush or anything like that, you know. So anyway, there's some, there's some abstracts out there on it, but I, I, I really highly recommend that. And this may just be the beginning uh, of um, the ways to modulate hormone uh, pathways. Uh, there are uh, other agents, PI3 kinase inhibitors and so on. Um, uh, Linda, you want to comment on, on some of the other directions that are being looked at to augment hormonal therapy effectiveness? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of clinical trials uh, being conducted in which they're combining PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, dual, um, dual inhibitors of PI3 kinase and mTOR in uh, patients with metastatic breast cancer. I think, uh, and I think all of us would agree that anything which augments our hormonal therapy would be tremendous for our patients. I think some of the challenges are really, once again, in identifying the patients who are uh, good candidates for this, because I don't know what your feeling was coming away from ASCO this year in the session on the PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, was, but it really made me feel like we really we really don't know who are the right patients for these trials, and I almost feel like we're just a little bit back to the drawing board on that, just to really, I mean, what's, what is obvious? I mean, it wasn't obvious, because even looking uh, at patients who had mutations necessarily was not predictive of response. So, so I, think, um, I think the future is pretty bright in terms of really focusing in on the various hormonal therapies that are out there, and a lot of other new drugs, too. I mean, abiraterone is being looked at in breast cancer. Yeah, enzalutamide, biclutamide, particularly mm -hmm. in the triple negative subset, there seems to be a fraction of patients who will benefit from those kinds of drugs.